All right. Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Uh, you know, as husbands and wives, um, men and women who are married, well, as you get to be living together, um, you know, you kind of let the walls down a little bit. You let the guards down a little bit. And, and sometimes even in the way that you talk and communicate to one another um, isn't the way that you once would have communicated because now you're used to each other. Well, I read of a story, basically, of, of the seven stages of a married cold. Um, meaning, when a couple is first married and one of them gets sick, um, you have a tendency to treat each other a little bit better but as the years go on, things kind of digress, I, I guess you could say. So in the first year, you know, the, the wife gets sick, and it's like, it's like sugar dumplings. I am worried about that sneeze, baby girl. You know, I want to make sure that you're okay. Why don't you get in bed? I'm going to make you some Campbell soup and rub your feet and, and make sure you're taken care of. By year two, it's, it's, listen, darling, I don't like the sound of that cough. I'm going to call Dr. Miller. Why don't you get in bed, relax right now, and, and I'll make sure everything's taken care of. By the third year, honey, you better lie down. Nothing like a little bit of rest when you feel lousy, um, and I will bring you some crackers to eat. By year four, now look, dear, let's be sensible. Once you fed the kids and, and got the dishes done and waxed the floor, why don't you go lie down? By year five, it's, it's, well, if you're not feeling good, why don't you just take some aspirin or something? <laughs> By year six is, man, I wish you would gargle something and quit sitting there and barking like a seal. And by year seven, it's, it's for goodness sake, stop sneezing. Are you trying to give me pneumonia? You know, love has a way of growing cold over time unless we work at it and keep it fresh and keep it alive. You know, things change. Life changes. People move on, right? People come, people go. Um, every part of life, there is a constant change. And the person you married uh, isn't the person that is, you know, with you today. You know, things change. They're, they might be a little bit bigger. You know what I mean? They, they might weigh a little bit more. Um, you might have kids now. Things progress, things change. And that's the way it is in, in every part of life, isn't it? Uh, you know, 15 years ago, we had like Johnny Cash... Bob Hope, uh, Steve Jobs, but today we have no cash, no hope, no jobs. Oh, Lord, please don't let Kevin Bacon die. Um, you know, like, what would we do without bacon? Um, you know, like, things change, things progress, life changes, and, and marriage is difficult, and marriages change. But God didn't design marriage to be something that we just simply have to endure painfully. Rather, he designed it as something to be enjoyed wholeheartedly. He wants it to be a blessing and not a burden. And in order for us to grow and experience the maximum amount of satisfaction in marriage, it's essential for a woman to understand the uniqueness of her husband and for a man to understand the uniqueness of his wife. And all of this is hard work. It's lifelong work. But in the end, it pays a rich, unbelievable dividends. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at the process of, of really bringing about change in our marriages, restoration, I would say, and or reconciliation, especially after last week's message when we saw this married couple have their first fight as a married couple. And so I've titled this morning's message, if you're taking notes, just that, Restoration and Reconciliation. Because it's not just enough to say I'm sorry and move on, that things have to be restored and, and the relationship has to be reconciled. And we'll be looking at chapter 5, verse 9, through chapter 6, verse 3, and we'll be looking at her part. And then chapter 6, verse 4 through 10, we'll then look at his part. Now, if this is your first time or you haven't been in a while, I want to just set the scene so we're all on the same page, moving in the right direction. Uh, for us as a church, Mile High Calvary, we are a Bible-believing church, and we believe the Word of God. And so because we believe the Word of God, 
Um, we teach it chapter by chapter, book by book, verse by verse, and we go through it to get the whole counsel of God. And we believe that all scripture is God-given, it's God-breathed. Second Timothy chapter 3 says that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And as we're going through the Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon really is a love story. It's a story between a man and a woman. And it's a musical. It's called the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon for a reason. It's a musical. They're singing back and forth to one another. And what we've seen thus far in this relationship is we've seen in chapter one this mutual attraction. We saw that they had character. Uh, We saw that they had a a deeper sense of who they were. And then it went from... um, kind of basically uh, attraction to dating and then from dating to a deeper form of dating called courting or, or basically from hanging out to sorting out or from getting to know one another to understanding one another. Then it moved to engagement and then we saw the wedding day. We saw the honeymoon, which was awesome. And then last week they got home from their honeymoon and they had their first fight. And really their first fight was birthed out of unmet expectations. He didn't call, was home late, she locked the door. Men, if the door is locked, it's usually a sign that something is wrong, okay? And that's what took place. And now what we see here is this couple really, well, last week was a bump in the road, and now this couple is wanting to work it out. And they will put the work necessary to work it out. The honeymoon is over, but the marriage is not. This is just the beginning. They're in it for the long haul. And so notice our first point, her part. Chapter 5, verse 9, it says, The daughters of Jerusalem, what is your beloved more than another beloved? O fairest amongst women, what is your beloved more than another beloved? Did I just repeat myself? That you so charge us. Verse 10, my beloved is white and ruddy, chief amongst ten thousands. His head is like the finest gold. His his locks are heavy or are are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes like doves by the rivers of the water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices. Banks of scented herbs, his lips are lilies dripping liquid myrrh, his hands are rods of gold set in barrel, his body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires, his legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold, his countenance like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is is most sweet, yes, it is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Where has your beloved gone, O fairest amongst women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flocks in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock amongst the lilies." Remember what happened last week. If you weren't here with us, this is kind of a part two of last week because last week was the fight. This week is them kind of making up. And, and what happened last week was Solomon came home late. It, to, it told us that the dew was on his hair, giving us the indication that he had come home late. He didn't call. He didn't text. He didn't write. He didn't send a messenger. He didn't send smoke signals. He did not let her know. He didn't communicate properly. Well, when he got home, the door was locked, and she basically said, how can I put my clothes back on? How can I get my feet dirty after I've washed him, which was Hebrew for, I have a headache, nothing's happening tonight, this door is locked, I'm shutting this thing down, right? And so what we see through that process is they both get bummed out, frustrated with one another, this unmet expectation, and and so he leaves, and typically, that's usually the case in a lot of relationships. Um, the, someone will get mad and someone will go for a walk, get in the car, go for a drive, sleep on the couch, sleep in the guest room, whatever the case might be whenever a fight takes place. And when that happened, it told us last week that she realized what, what she had done by locking the door. Um, 
basically hurt his male ego. Uh, his pr- pride got in the way. And, and so what took place was she then goes searching for him. And, and what we see here is she says in verse 8, of chapter 5, my, my friends, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem. Remember, these are her, her buddies. They jump into the book every once in a while and do their own little doo-wop because it's a musical. And so what we see is she tells them, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell him I am lovesick. And this is where we pick up her friend's response. In verse 9, what is your beloved more than another beloved? O fairest amongst women, women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? The tone and tense of their question is not negative. It seems negative, like who's your beloved? Who is he? But really what they are asking her is they, they, they respected King Solomon. He was the king. But what they're doing is they're asking her, remind us why he's so special to you. Remind us why he's important to you. Ladies, I will start by saying this. You want girlfriends like this. Oftentimes, what happens is, well, ladies will get together to discuss the subject of their husbands. And usually what happens in the process is they digress to become bashing sessions over their husbands. Well, my husband did this, and my husband did that, and my husband, well, yeah, well, you don't have well, you, my husband. And, and what ends up happening is, is many times we try to spiritualize it and say, well, we're getting together to pray for our husbands, but you never end up praying. And they become these bashing sessions for, over our husbands, and that's not what we're called to do. We're actually called to stir one another to love and good works, the Bible tells us. Ladies, you need friends like this. Well, honey, you married him. Like, why did you marry him? Well, let me give you some good counsel here. What's so special about your husband? That's what they do here. Well, you're lovesick for him? Well, tell us about him. Well, what's he like? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on it. You know, if your husband's been a jerk lately, there's got to be something good there. If there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on that. Oh, he did park the car in the garage, right? You know, like, whatever it might be, Think on those things, because when you allow your mind to digress into bad, evil, ugly areas, it doesn't end up well. And so her friends remind, for her friends say, remind us what's so special. And what she does is she lays out from verse 10 to basically chapter 6, verse 3, why she views her husband as special. And it's a lengthy description of, of Solomon, his physical and his spiritual characteristics, now, remember, this is Hebrew poetry. This is Hebrew parallelism. And so some of the things that they call each other or say don't make sense to us because, well, they made sense in their culture, but for us, they might be a little bit rude. So when she says, you know, my beloved is white and ruddy, no dude wants to be called white and ruddy. I'm just letting you know that. You're going to want to update your language to 2016. But what we see here is, is she says, in essence, his, his appearance is handsome. Verse 11, uh, his head is like the finest gold, meaning he, his wisdom is more valuable than gold. We know that Solomon was a smart cookie. Um, we know that he was very wise, uh, made a lot of money, and so on. Um, notice his locks are, are wavy and black uh, as, as a raven. Um, his eyes are like a dove, gentle and tender. Um, fitly set, meaning he could be trusted. She could look in his eyes and know that he was telling the truth. Verse 13, she says, in essence, that he is compassionate towards her, that when he kisses her, he does so tenderly and sweet. You know, he's like, love me tender, love me sweet. You know that? You guys know that song? Come on now. You do, right? Everyone 23 and under is like, I've never heard that song in my entire life. Look it up. It's awesome. Um, Notice 
he, she, verse 14 and 15 talks about his legs, pillars of marble, and, and his hands, rods of gold. Um, these are analogies that speak of the fact that Solomon was strong. He was dependable. She could count on him. The things that she describes about him speak uh, of sturdy in character, conviction, leadership, spiritually strong, strong in protection. In all reality, what we see through her description of him is that she respected him. Ladies, one of the greatest, single, most desires of a man is that he is respected by his wife. It really is the greatest desire for most men. We mentioned this last week, but, but like, listen, we, we, sure, we love, you know, kisses and cuddles and hugs and all of that stuff, but if we know that our wives respect us, that we are respectable, that, that, she trusts us, that she understands us, it gives us what we would call maybe that that oomph to conquer the world. When I know that my wife respects me and and understands me and and knows that, that I'm working hard for our family and so on, then she, by doing that, gives me the ability, the thought frame of mind to to go out and conquer the world because I know that she respects me. Notice, she says that his mouth is most sweet, altogether lovely, referring to probably, you know, maybe his kisses, but maybe even the way that he speaks to her. And then she says, this is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Ladies, do you view your husband as your friend? Do you view your husbands as your friend? Not as your mortal enemy, that you're duking it out with over the credit card or the house or, but do you view him as your friend? She says, this is the reason why I married him. And what we see here is a woman who respects her husband. Her whole perspective has changed. Last week, she was like, nothing's happening. You didn't call, you didn't write. And now she comes back saying, man, this is is the guy that I married. This is the the man that I want to spend my life with. And they ask in in chapter 6, they ask him or ask her, well, where do you think he's gone then? Where where do you think he is? And she says, ah, I know. Verse 2, my beloved's gone to his garden. Uh, Remember, Solomon wasn't just a king. He was also a, a shepherd, but also on top of that, an amazing botanist. He was very uh, well equipped in regards to dealing with flowers and planting things. Um, we know he planted whole forests. We know that there, if you go to Israel with us, we're going in October of 2017. If you go with us, we'll take you to a section of Jerusalem that was a, a forest, a nice, beautiful garden planted by Solomon, most believe. And she says, well, that's probably where he is. Remember, he walked away last night. And now it's probably morning. He's going back to work. But what she sees here is that really nothing has changed because she loves her husband. She cares for him. She views him as a friend. Yes, there were some unmet expectations. Yes, they, they, they had a, a little bit what we would call a bumping of heads. But she really does love him. And in this, we see her repentance For her behavior, she really, in essence, goes from against him to for him. She repents. She changes directions. And she can't live without him. She's like, tell all my friends I'm lovesick. I I need to be with him. And what we see is she offers him forgiveness. She's not looking for him to nag him. She's not looking for him to to put him down or to put him in his place, but rather to bring reconciliation to the relationship. Remember, it's not about fighting to win. It's about fighting to reconcile and make things right. That's that's the goal. When, when, When there's conflict between a husband and wife, it's not like, I want to fight to win. No, you want to fight to reconcile. Because winning doesn't end up winning in the end. Winning, you end up losing. Notice what we see from his part, chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Oh, my beloved, you are as beautiful as Terzach, 
lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up for the washing, and everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veil. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed. The queen and concubines and they praised her who is she who looks forth as the morning fair as the moon clear as the sun awesome as an army with banners i love what we see here she goes looking for solomon she finds him in the garden really aka his office space this is where he works she goes there finds him she feels bad and wants to make things right notice she's the one that does make things right Typically, it takes someone in the relationship to get off of the merry-go-round and, and break the ice, to make things right. First, somebody has to make a move. Because you can stew or you can forgive. You can fester or you can reconcile. And someone has to get off the merry-go-round at, at, some, at some point. My wife and I, typically, um, when we, we argue and, and, and so on, I, I mentioned this last week, and you're like, you argue? Yes, we do. You're a pastor. <laughs> I don't care, okay? We argue. Like, we have problems. And, and typically, because of my pride and my stubbornness, she's usually the one to break the ice. And it's usually, um, are you not going to talk to me all day? I was planning on it, you know, like, like, because I'm just proudful and stubborn and, and just, and, and typically that's usually our code for one another to really just, okay, listen, like there, something's not right here. Our relationship is broken. We're, we're not okay. We need to deal with this because we can't allow this to fester between us. Somebody, someone's got to make the move. She does. She goes to his office space. She's like, listen, you didn't come home last night. You walked away. What's going on? And notice his response. Oh, my love, you are beautiful. Forgiveness needs to be communicated, men. When she comes to say sorry and seeks, for, seeks forgiveness, it's not just enough to go, fine. It's not just enough to say, well, let's just move on. No, 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 notice his response. He greets her with words of love, and in doing so, we see his own repentance. Why? Because he doesn't, well, you should have unlocked the door last night. Well, you should have. No, 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 no. He says, oh, my love, my dove. He might have been mad or disappointed last night, but not now. And men, I, I'll, I'll tell you, your wife needs words of affirmation to know that the relationship is okay. She needs word. You need to fill this little bad boy up with nouns and pronouns and adjectives to reaffirm your love for her. Because notice what he does. He doesn't play the silent treatment. He's ready, willing, and open. My love, my dove, you are beautiful. Uh, to to ter, Terzach, was an ancient Canaanite city. It was a city of refuge. And then he says, ultimately, even Jerusalem. Jerusalem is always the prize. It's always the, the city on a hill. He equates her and saying, listen, you are a refuge for me. You are, are the city on a hill for me. And notice he recites some of the words that we saw on their honeymoon. Verse 6 is my favorite. It's one of my favorite verses in all of Song of Solomon. We see it a couple of times. Your teeth are like the flocks of sheep which have come up from the washing. Every one bears twins and none is barren among them. <laughs> Baby, you got all your teeth and I love it. You know, you're not like a hockey player, you know, like you got them like they're all there and they've been washed and none's barren. I, I just, what he does here, notice what he does here is he quotes from the things that he said on their honeymoon. 
And by reciting the words he used on their wedding night, he is basically saying nothing has changed. Nothing's changed. From that night to here and now, nothing has changed. I still love you. I still feel the same way about you, for better, for worse, for sickness and health, till death do us part. We, we're still in this together. See, the hard part when us as guys and gals, when we get into fights and, and issues in our, our marriage relationship, the hard part is we don't really fully understand one another. And the Bible doesn't have a lot to say on, listen, this is the way men are, and this is the way women are, and it doesn't have a lot to say. I, there are verses like, like, you know, men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Women, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Okay, yeah, we, we get that. But those are roles. It doesn't really talk a lot about, like, that, that women are maybe a little bit more emotional than men. Um, men are more visual than women. It doesn't talk about those things. This is the reason why that book... Um, men are from Mars, women are from Venus was such a number one hit because it gave men and women a good grasp and a good understanding of the way we act and or react to one another. You know, like, like when a guy is talking to his wife and he's like, honey, honey, like put down the vacuum. You've been working hard enough. You need to take a break. That's code for, I can't hear the game. We need to get that vacuum turned off. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> You know, when a guy um, is, is, you know, honey, honey, can I help you make dinner? It, that's usually code for like, why isn't dinner ready yet? Do I need to help her to hurry it up? You know, like, uh, why? Because, because we, we communicate so differently. So how are we to then treat one another as men and women? Well, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of resources and or insight, except there is a verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, for some of us, we hear that verse and like, we want to rile up, weaker vessel, huh? What? You know, I'm, well, I'm strong. And, and you know, the lady with the do-rag and the, you guys know that lady from like World War II? No? Yes? Okay. World War II? I don't know where it came from. I'm just, now I'm proving my idiotic ways. But what we see here is, is it's not referring to, it's not referring to moral character, intellectual ability, spiritual perception, okay? When it says the w woman is a weaker vessel, it's not referring to those things. Um, what it is referring to rather is, is the way that a man and a woman are able to treat one another. And so this is the way that I look at it. Um, not a weaker vessel in the sense of being weak, but a weaker vessel in the sense of maybe being more delicate. And so uh, a lady is more of a wine glass versus men are more like thermoses, okay? And so how do you treat a wine glass? Do you chuck it in your truck and, and you know, throw it around? And, and No, 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 how do you treat a wine glass? You, you clean it, you polish it, you take care of it, you put it on display and hang it upside down over like one of those bar thingies, you know, and you know what I mean? Like a wine glass is a delicate deal. It has nothing to do with um, uh, its strength. It has everything to do with how it's handled versus a thermos. What do you do with the thermos? Put hot stuff in it, cold stuff in it, throw it in your truck, construction site falls out, like so, so the idea of what Peter's talking about is that, that ladies, men, understand this, that ladies must be handled a little bit differently than you would your thermos. Meaning you probably need to communicate with your wife a little bit differently than you would with your bros. You know? So, so, so for example, I got two little girls and I have a son. I have a son and two little girls. I talk to my son a little bit differently than I do my girls. Why? Because weaker vessel. I, I need to treat them differently. So if I'm like, hey, you need to get upstairs. You need to clean your room. All right. Gets upstairs, cleans his room. Hey, you need to get upstairs, cleans his room, clean your room. <gasps> My dad hates me. Why does he hate me, man? I don't hate you. Like, like, I just told you to clean your room, but I did. I promise I didn't. It's like, okay, listen, listen here. We're like, we got to deal with some of this. Right. Sweetheart, can you please go clean your room? Sure, dad. Why? 
because the perception's differently. You know what I mean? So, so it's not, it has nothing to do with, with strength or ability or character or anything like that, but it has everything to do with how they're handled. And so she's more delicate, more sacred of a vessel, needs to be put up on display, needs to be taken care of, needs to be polished. Men are like, you know, mugs. Women are like fine china. And I think it's in something, um, I think it also has something to do with a, a, mo- a woman's emotional makeup. And, and so notice, you know, guys have a tendency to bounce back a little bit quicker. Ladies have a tendency to stew and think over things. And remember, it's because your mind is moving a million miles a minute. It's true. And, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago. And guys, guys just, we have a file in our brains called the nothing file. And we go to that file as often as we can. So when you're like thinking of school and lunches and backpacks and kids and soccer and and work, if you work, and you've got all of these things going on in your mind, and you're like, hey, what are you thinking? Nothing. (laughs) Why? Because we're thinking nothing. That's impossible. Right, ladies? You're like, that's impossible. Totally possible. (laughs) Like nothing. Like nothing is happening right now. And, and so, so in the way that we deal and communicate with one another, we've got to, we've got to remember to be sensitive to those things, and men specifically. When, when there's conflict and there's issues and there's fighting and there's problems, it doesn't help to go to your wife and be like, woman, it doesn't help. But rather when you come and you're like, listen, honey, I love you. You're my love, my dove, my perfect one. I know that we're fighting right now. I know that there's some issues right now, but listen, this doesn't change my feelings or my, our relationship. That goes a long, long way versus just get over it. It goes a long, long way. Not that I've ever said, just get over it. Maybe (laughs) once. And I learned my lesson. All right. See, here's, here's what we see through this. Is it, it reveals that the, the woman's deepest rational need is to be loved. At the same time, women understand that the husband's deepest rational need is to feel respected. And here's what happens. When a woman feels unloved, she reacts in a way that seems disrespectful to her husband. And then he reacts to this disrespect in a way that's unloving to his wife. And then she complains and criticizes, and the more he shuts down and stonewalls. And so what happens is the cycle starts and it's got to be broken. And couples that don't deal with hurts or issues or problems or the way that you communicate to one another, those things fester and they grow. And all of this is birthed out of unmet expectations. You expected him to do something and he didn't. She expected you to do something and he didn't. And, and Solomon has, plen- has had plenty of time to deal with this. His anger, frustration. Notice he didn't yell at her when she came to him. He didn't cuss her out. He didn't freak out. He, as a matter of fact, re solidifies the relationship. And what we see through the process here then is the relationship is reconciled towards one another. He says, no woman can hold a candle to you. He, he then for, speaks of, of her being as fair as a moon, clear as the sun. Awesome. Men, is your wife awesome? Like, is she just, is your husband your friend and is your wife awesome? Is, is she awesome to you? Solomon and his wife repented of their wrong attitudes from the night before. They repented of their stubborn pride from the night before. And the result is, verse uh, 13, notice, Return, O Shulamite, return, that we may look upon you, that we may see you in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of two camps. That they've been brought together. Verse 12 talks about them riding together in a chariot. Now, this is, this is a big deal because if you know anything about chariots in that day, when two people rode together, they quite literally had to balance one another out and they had to be in sync. Hey, hey, bye, bye, bye. Right? Like, they had to be, 
Oh, come on. <laughs> Little Justin Timberlake there. Um, and and so, so the idea is that they have to be in sync. They have to be able to counteract the weight so that the, the chariot doesn't go tipping over. On top of that, when you rode around in a chariot with someone, it was a sign of recognition that this person is a person you're really um, in tune with. And so by Solomon saying, by, by them saying these things, they're saying, listen, we are in sync. We are one. We're in tune with one another. You're the most important person to me. And the result was that what we see here is that there's forgiveness and reconciliation that ultimately leads to these two camps dancing. When a husband and wife are in sync, in tune, when, when they're rocking it out, when they're um, not fighting, when there's reconciliation, when there is restoration to the relationship, it's like a beautiful dance. And if you're able to uh, then move from that, from fester and bitterness and frustration and so on to that, then maybe I'll end up with like a nice slow dance. And then we get to chapter seven next week <laughs> and we see makeup sex. You're like, did he just say that? I did. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. It's in the Bible. Read chapter seven ne for next week. I mean, whoo. There's a lot of clusters and vines and all kinds of crazy stuff next week. As we close, as we close this section out, there are three things I'd like to take from um, this section of Scripture that hopefully we can apply to our lives. Number one, fighting, frustration, so on, you've got to have in your mind quick, slow, slow. Quick, slow, slow. Quick, slow, slow. Quick, slow, slow. Turn to your neighbor and say, quick, slow, slow. Okay, quick, slow, slow. Sometimes when we start to fight, we allow things to fester, we allow things to build up. Um, things can happen where, where we become rude to one another. They escalate quickly. And what we see here is Solomon and the Shulamite woman have discovered a better way to communicate. And the better way to communicate is quick, slow, slow. James chapter 1 verse 19 tells us this that you be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick, slow, slow. He lays out for us the pattern for really dealing with conflict. That if you are quick to listen, and we hear that and there's simplicity in that, of course you should listen to your spouse. But when you begin to sense that something isn't right, the door is locked. Um, there's, there's issues, something going on that you, this is the moment for you to cue in or, or hone in and listen. Be quick to listen. Number two, that you be slow to speak. You've heard that saying that, well, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You probably heard it from your mom. <laughs> I heard it from my mom. God gave it to you, like, thanks, mom. Meaning this, we all have something to say, right? We all have something to say. We have an opinion on everything. That's why we have Twitter, you know? It's like Twitter is there so that you can just vent in 140 characters your opinion about everything. And, and, and so, so the idea here is because we all have opinions and we all want to say something, we all want to get our way, it's better if we're slow to speak. Or the idea that, you know, it's been said that a closed mouth gathers no feet. And I can attest to that, you know. Being someone's opened his mouth and spoke before listening ended up with feet in my mouth. Proverbs 17, 27 says, He who has knowledge spares his words. And so this happens a lot in arguments. We have something important or critical to say, and rather than listening to our spouse, we're just waiting for them to be quiet so that we can tell them our opinion. Because we want to win. It's not about fighting below the belt, but rather fighting fair. It's not about fighting to win, but rather fighting to reconcile. And I think there would be a lot less heartache in our lives and sorrow and regret if we can avoid it 
or if we can zip it more, really. If we can zip it more. Sometimes some of the words that you really want to say probably shouldn't come out in your arguments. And some of us have said things that we actually all regret, right? In those arguments. So be quick to listen, slow to speak. The result of that will lead to slow to anger. If we're quick to listen, slow to speak, it's a whole lot easier to be slow to anger because emotions are involved and our feelings get hurt and we want to rise up and defend ourselves. But if we're slow to respond, we allow logic to come in. We allow humility maybe to come in. We allow the Holy Spirit maybe to work on our heart. If we're not thinking that our husband or our wife is out to get us, well, they're just out to get me. If we don't think that way, then, then, and we think that, man, they love me. They have the best for me. They have the best intentions for me. Maybe there is something in my life that I need to work on. I need to fix. I need to change. Then it allows those things to, to happen. It's amazing how much cooler heads can prevail if you're just willing to listen and understand their point of view. And the best way to, to prevent anger is, for, is if you and your spouse are communicating regularly and honestly when you're not facing conflict. If you guys are talking and communicating when things are good, when things go south, you're able to say, okay, this isn't character, this isn't what they're like typically, so, so what's going on here? So you quick, slow, slow. Number two, these are just some principles for communicating and how we communicate. Last week, we looked at the 11 nevers of fighting. I would recommend listening to it. The 11 nevers of fighting, right? Never yell, never lay your hands on your spouse, never use the kids as, as something to, to barter with, never talk about their mom or your mom or any of those things. Um, never mention Pastor Fern in a sermon, right? Or in a fight, right? And I, and I mentioned this last week because I, I don't want... If you mention me in a fight, you have diminished the opportunity I have to speak into your spouse's life because they're automatically going to think that I'm, I'm mad at them. So let just leave us preachers out of it, okay? You got yourself in it, get yourself out of it. Um, so, you know, just the 11 nevers, okay? But what we see here, notice this, is, is just because if, if we're able to be more disciplined and and stay away from our fleshly impulses, which are to be defensive and, and accusations to rise up, um, let's just use these principles for communication. Number one, you need to show that you're listening. Yes, quick, slow, slow. You need to show that you're listening. You can't have your back turned to them like, yes, are you listening to me? Yes, I'm listening to you. Or, you know, you need to make eye contact. Are you listening to me? Yeah, I'm listening to you. Yes, I'm playing Angry Birds. You know, like, you need to make eye contact. You need to sit down across from one another and show that you are listening. You look your spouse in the eye. You pay attention and focus. Number two, don't use logic to overpower feelings. Feelings are real. Feelings are real. And here's what happens. It's, this is typically the dude's fault. What happens is your wife will come to you and say, I feel like, well, I just feel like... And we as guys start thinking of all the reasons why she shouldn't feel that way. And then we want to tell her why she's wrong. And then she feels like she hasn't been heard. And it just doesn't get anywhere. You can't use logic to try to discredit her feelings. Because feelings are real. So let's work through them. Let's deal with them so that we can move forward. Number three, don't debate. Now this is hard in an argument. Why? Because you want to be heard and you want to go back and forth and back and forth. And, and you want to defend yourself, especially when your spouse says something ugly, mean, vile, hurtful, wrong, angry. Not that you give one another the silent treatment, but you need to, to sometimes feel, not feel the need to have to respond to every detail. You do this, you do this, you, well, okay. Not, well, I do it because of this, I do it because of that, and I, just don't debate. Um, number four, don't interrupt. This should make sense. Like, don't interrupt your spouse because what ends up happening is when you interrupt your spouse, they get a little bit louder. And then when now they're a little bit louder, now you want to get a little bit louder. And this is what happens 
yelling takes place because they don't feel like they're being heard. So, so you want to make sure you know, that you don't interrupt that, and that you don't just be listening for an opportunity to jump in and tell them why they're wrong. Number five, don't leave. Don't leave. This is a tough one, especially as we saw in the text. You know, Solomon wasn't perfect, and, and he left last week. Especially when someone is sharing their heart, um, it shows disinterest in the relationship when you walk out. It's like a slap in the face. You just can't do it. Number six, don't complain about your spouse to your family and friends. This is a selfish ploy to amass as many supporters for you and, and bring enemies against your spouse. So what we need to do and understand, it's okay to seek counsel, but there's a difference between counsel and complaining. And if all you ever do is go to your mom, and like, well, I can't believe she just knew, and he just knew, what happens is now you've given your mom or your friends or whatever a bad view and or perspective of your spouse. And we want to think on things that are good, lovely, pleasing, and acceptable. And number seven, avoid uninviting body language. And you guys know what I mean by that, right? Like posture, position, gestures. Like if you're looking at each other and you're trying to work it out and you're like this, oh, jeez, all the time. Like it just doesn't work. Or if you're like, I just can't believe you just clench fists. Your demeanor shows that you're not willing to communicate, and, and so marriage and communication, they're hard work, but it's worthwhile work. And lastly, and we'll close with this, forgiveness is key. Forgiveness is key in every relationship. When conflict hits, things can get out of control quickly. And it's in those moments that we become slaves to our emotions, to our impulses. Proverbs 18.2, you need to jot this down. Proverbs 18.2, Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinion. And this is so true. And we talk to our spouses in ways we would never talk to other people. And we treat the person we're supposed to be one flesh with in ways we would never talk to our bosses, in ways we would never talk to our uh, parents or our family members, but we talk to our spouse, the person you're supposed to be one flesh with, in ways that are ungodly, not pleasing, and or acceptable. You know, and then we rehearse in our minds why our spouses deserve what they deserve and what we are owed and we didn't get what we're owed. And I said this last week. If you are making a mental list of all the reasons why your spouse is wrong, you have now put yourself in the same company as Satan. Because the Bible tells us that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us day and night. And the moment you're making that mental list, they're wrong and they're wrong and they're wrong, you have now become their accuser and you're in the same party as the devil. This is why James tells us, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know that word flee? It's the Greek word fugo. This is, this is God's hip-hop way of saying foo, go. <laughs> All right? Flee, fugo. All right? Flee, get out of there. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Forgiveness needs to be expressed. And this is a non negotiable in marriages. Forgiveness needs to be expressed. Listen, listen. Forgiveness is required, trust is another thing. Trust takes time to build. It takes time to, to see character and motive and, and so on and so forth. But, but first and foremost, forgiveness has to happen. Trust is a whole other issue. And, and we, can, we can conquer that and talk about that later, consistent actions and behaviors and so on. But forgiveness, sometimes we don't want to offer forgiveness, especially if we've been wounded until we see some sort of real repentance. But it's for, important for us to understand that that's not the way forgiveness works. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We forgive because Jesus doesn't hold a grudge against us. 
And if we're truly going to love our wives as Christ loved the church, then we're going to forgive. And if we're going to truly submit to our husbands as unto the Lord, then we're really going to forgive. What we're talking about here is more than normal day-to-day conflicts that need to be worked out, maybe. Maybe something bigger has happened. But forgiveness is key in a marriage. And so let's remember to continually offer that because it's been offered to us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much that um, Song of Solomon is there for our reading, for us to know and learn and grow and understand. And I, I know that there might be some people here this morning, dear Jesus, who have never received your full forgiveness or grace. We never want to leave here without giving them an opportunity to. And, and maybe you're here and you've never experienced the forgiveness and grace and mercy of God. Let me tell you, he is offering it to you. He stands at the door and knocks. He's not going to yell at you or accuse you or blame you for the things you've done. No, he desires to have relationship with you. And he says, you are beautiful. You are lovely. So much so that I would die on a cross for you. And so if that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you to lift your hand so I can pray for you. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I just want to lift you up to the Lord. Is there anyone here this morning? God bless you. I see your hand. Anyone else? God bless you. I see your hand. Any, anyone else? Amen. Dear God, I thank you for those hands that are raised. We know that you desire to do a new work in their lives. They receive, believe, where they have salvation in you, forgiveness above all. And so we ask and pray, dear God, that you would work in them. And if that's you and you raise your hand, just repeat this prayer after me. It's not magical. It's just something you have to mean from your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness I ask that you would come into my heart, into my life, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, and that you would make me a new creation today. I want to follow you, honor you, love you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.